Hi, I'm Valerie Aurora, founder of Frameshift Consulting. You're about to watch an edited video of an online ally skills workshop, which teaches people with more power and privilege how to support people who have less. The video won't take the place of participating in a live ally skills workshop. It's just intended to give you an idea of the workshop content and my facilitation style. We have edited out all of the comments from the participants in order to protect their privacy, and instead I just summarize what they say. The full workshop is three hours long and centered around the discussion by workshop participants, not so much me talking. To learn more about having an ally skills workshop at your organization, go to the URL I'm about to show you on the next screen. Thanks! Update my Zoom because apparently I have more information about what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to spend about 30 minutes in an introduction where I'll, I'll talk about how to get have a really good discussion about um, these different scenarios we're coming up with. Uh, we'll spend about 45 minutes doing a group discussion of real world, real world scenarios where an ally could take action. We'll take a short break and we'll do another 90 minutes of uh, scenario discussion. So there will be this sort of long introduction part and then the rest of it will be you talking to each other in breakout rooms and then sharing together. Uh, it, there'll be a short wrap up at the end and the whole thing's about three hours long. We have a little extra time uh, just to give us a buffer. I just want to uh, say that if you're looking at that and thinking, wow, three hours is a long time, I just want to let you know that uh, when I did this workshop as a two hour workshop, the most common complaint I got in the survey was that it was too short. So three hours seems to be uh, right in the middle for everyone. Okay, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the founder of Frameshift Consulting, which is a diversity and inclusion in technology consulting company in San Francisco. Uh, before that, I was the co-founder and the executive director of the Ada Initiative, which supported women in uh, open source software, uh, Wikipedia, open hardware, uh, uh, fan culture, things like that. The first project I did there is I was the lead author on a, of a code of conduct that's now in use by thousands of conferences, uh, most tech conferences. Uh, so if you were going to a conference and uh, there's a code of conduct, I might have had something to do with that. Uh, oh, yes, your own company code of conduct is, is uh, part of this. Uh, I've spent over 10 years doing volunteer work with geek feminism and other uh, international organizations. And I've taught this workshop to over 2,000 people around the world. Uh, so most recently, uh, Sweden uh, and New Zealand, as well as a bunch of other places. I was also a Linux kernel and file systems developer for over 10 years, uh, which I am telling you about because I'm using my technical privilege. So let me explain what technical privilege is. Uh, you probably noticed this so since you work at a software company. Um, People who are technical are often listened to more than people who are not technical. Uh, that's fine when it's when somebody is talking about their area of expertise, uh, but it doesn't help when they're talking about something that they're not an expert in. So for example, if a computer security uh, expert says to you, hey, you should change your password, they're probably right, you should probably change your password. But if a computer security expert says, here's how we should be doing interviews, um, there's nothing about their expertise that directly translates to that. And yet, we're more likely to listen to them about how to do interviews and even about where to go to have lunch, right? So uh, the other interesting thing about technical privilege is that it's not equally available to all. Uh, so uh, white men in particular get it more often. Uh, as a white woman, I have to fight for my technical privilege all the time. So what I'm doing in this workshop is I'm both using my technical privilege while destroying it at the same time. And hopefully, you'll be able to find some areas where you have privilege that you can do something similar. Uh, all right, so just as a reminder, it's totally fine to ask questions. Just use the little raise hand thing or just interrupt verbally if you're comfortable with that. Uh, all right, so um, we'll start with some, some terminology. Uh, we need to know these before we can know what an ally is. So privilege is an unearned advantage given by society to some people, but not all. Uh, and the important part here is that, the, that it's unearned. Uh, oppression is systemic pervasive inequality that is present throughout society. It benefits people with more privilege and harms those with fewer privileges. So it's sort of the converse of privilege. It's what makes privilege possible, is that you push down a group of people to raise up another group of people. A target in this context is someone who suffers from oppression. I also call this a member of a marginalized group. Uh, this is my favorite term to use for talking about this sort of stuff. Um, often we'll say something like underrepresented group or minorities but a group can be in the majority and still be uh, the, the target of oppression. Marginalized group says this is a group that for some reason is pushed towards the edge of society um, that, that is uh, the target of oppression. 
So an ally is a, a member of a social group that enjoys some privilege that's doing two things. They're working to end oppression and understand their own privilege. So some interesting points here about target and ally. Um, the first one is that depending on what's most relevant about you to the situation, in one situation, you might be a target. In another situation, you might be able to act as an ally. Uh, so I'm a white woman. If my race is most relevant to a situation, I'm more likely to be able to act as an ally. If my gender is most relevant to a situation, I'm more likely to be a target. Uh, the other interesting thing about target and ally is that uh, as a target, uh, you don't have to do anything to be a target. You can just be sitting in a chair doing nothing and being, you will be a target. Uh, but you're only an ally when you're taking action. An ally isn't about an identity, it's about what you are doing uh, in the moment. So uh, I like to talk more about ally skills and ally actions than ally as an identity. All right, so let's do a concrete example. Um, here's a privilege you might have and not even know that you have. Uh, that's the ability to interview for a job and have the interviewer assume that if you have children, you will continue doing a good job at work. Uh, oppression in this situation would be a, a whole system, and these are just a few of the parts of it. Uh, family members' expectations that women will take on most of the childcare. Uh, fathers using paternity leave for things other than childcare. Uh, the belief that mothers don't want to return to full-time paid work, work after they become a mother. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other parts of this as well. That's just a few, few of the elements. Uh, the target would be any woman who wants to work for pay for an employer. Uh, many women are working, just not in this situation. Uh, and an ally is a man who does things like, um, takes on significant childcare responsibilities, uh, donates to women's causes, uses paternity leave for childcare rather than starting a business or something like that, uh, speaks up at work against stereotypes about mothers, uh, and reads news articles about privileges that fathers enjoy and mothers don't. All right, any questions on this? Great. All right, so, um, can you act as an ally in a particular situation? Uh, here's a list of privileges you might have um, that would give you an advantage in some situations. So if you're part of the dominant ethnic group, if you're male, if you're cisgender, which means the ge your gender is the same as the gender assigned to you at birth, uh, if you're straight, not disabled, if you're a legal resident or citizen of where you live and work, if you speak certain languages or speak certain languages more or less well, um, if you're specific ages, uh, if you're a certain height, size, or shape, so an interesting uh, factoid for, is that in the United States, um, uh, uh, the Fortune 500 CEOs who are men are on average uh, 2.5 inches taller than the average man in the United States, right? So hmm, height and CEO-ness, why are these connected? Uh, if you're not a mother, if you're not a caregiver, that gives you advantages. Uh, if you're educated, so this is the first one where people are usually like, wait a minute, I worked really hard for my education. And it's true, most of us did work really hard for our education. Uh, however, um, education isn't equally available to all. So it varies depending on where you are in the world, how, how uh, available education is to people. But in general, um, it's more available to people with more money, people who are part of the dominant ethnic group, um, people who are male, all that sort of stuff. So the Specific example from the United States is that uh, our RV, Ivy League universities, the top level universities such as Harvard, have a concept called legacy admissions, which is that if one of your parents went to that university, you are more likely to be admitted to that university, which is the definition of an unearned advantage, right? So technical experience is similar, that there's a lot of barriers to getting technical experience. Uh, wealth can be earned, but in today's economy, it's most often uh, inherited. And of course, if you're from an upper class family or high caste, uh, then you didn't do anything to deserve that. Uh, so there's other, other privileges out there, but that's a, a, a way to get started and say, hey, if I have those things, uh, then there's a situation in which I'm likely to be able to act as an ally. So I have an entire talk about why allies should take action more often than targets, but uh, here it's called Focus on Allies. I'll just give you one piece of research that I cite in the talk. Uh, the quote from this paper is, ethnic minority or female leaders who engage in diversity valuing behavior are penalized with worse performance ratings, whereas ethnic majority or male leaders who engage in diversity valuing behavior are not penalized for doing so. So we'd really like to live in a world in which everyone is rewarded for engaging in diversity valuing behavior. Uh, but what, where we are right now is um, uh, some people are not punished for it, for it, and those people are people who are acting as allies. Uh, I've actually, of course, seen um, some allies uh, be rewarded for this work. 
uh, which is great to see. The most important point to, to take away from this research is that uh, if you have seen a target advocating for themselves or for their group and getting punished in some way, you know, uh, their job threatened or people sending them death threats or something like that, it's really unlikely that that's going to happen to you if you ad advocate for them as an ally. Um, so be brave, take a risk, and see what happens. It's probably going to be more positive than you think. Just a quick, few quick notes about what this workshop is not. Uh, it's not a certification. Please don't run out and tell everyone, I've taken the Ally Skills Workshop. I'm a certified ally now. Uh, it's not a poly an apology for anything you did in the past, and it's not a way to get out of anything that you do in the future. Uh, you just need to take care of all those things um, uh, yourself. So uh, there's no time that we've only got three hours, so there's no time to discuss if oppression exists, if it's bad, if we should stop it. Uh, but I highly recommend checking out the uh, Geek Feminism Wiki. There's a link to that and all the other URLs in this uh, workshop uh, in the handout uh, that I sent you all. If, uh, if you don't have access to the, the handout, um, uh, this is a good time to, to grab it right now. If, if someone could um, repost the handout material or the handout link in the chat, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so just we're gonna, the rest of the introduction, we're just gonna do a short guide to terminology, which you'll wanna open up that handout really uh, right now to take a look at while, while we're doing that. Then we'll go over the very basics of ally skills because we're gonna learn most of it during the scenario discussion. Then we'll, we'll do some quick discussion guidelines about how to get the most out of your discussions. Uh, and then we'll go into the group discussion and then we'll have the wrap up. All right, so um, it's really important to figure out the right words to use uh, when you are talking about um, groups of people. It's, a, it's important, an important part of ally work. Uh, so I once had someone come up to me after a workshop and say, hey, uh, just give me a list of all the words I'm supposed to use, and all the words I'm not supposed to use, and I'll just memorize them and I'll be done, right? Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, language changes and evolves. It's, it's uh, like any, any other area of human endeavor. Uh, if you walked up to somebody and said, look, just tell me all the things I know about program I need to know about programming, uh, and all the things I don't need to know, and I'll just memorize that and I'll be done. And you're like, no, of course, it's uh, any area of knowledge keeps changing. So uh, this is a, a super important thing you can do as an ally is keep up with the, the terminology and how words are being are changing. So that handout I've sent you, I uh, update that about every month, it's, uh, part of my work. Uh, so we're not going to go over everything in the handout. Um, uh, on the terminology, the terminology stops or starts at the beginning of the second page and or, or the beginning of the first page and takes up the second page. Uh, but you, if, when we come to a scenario and if you're not sure about what words to use, you can look up the topic in the handout. I just want to give you all a, a minute to quickly look through the terminology right now and ask any questions if you have anything about, um, any questions about anything uh, surprising or that you're not sure about. So go ahead and take a look. Um, so it's an interesting situation. Uh, uh, Ladies is often something we use when we're super excited, like, well, I'm addressing a group of all women. You know, this doesn't happen that often. Um, it feels colloquial and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I started going into it more and discovered there's a lot of associations around class and race around ladies. Also around, um, so, so people are like, well, you use it for somebody who you consider to be a higher class. Uh, it's often uh, associated um, with uh, anti-black racism in the United States. And uh, it's also associated with uh, expecting women to have proper behavior or to behave well, right? Uh, so this really was brought home to me when um, uh, a, I was, a man was harassing me on the street and uh, I did not take it. He was very upset about it and said uh, uh, that it was okay to punch me. He would never punch a lady, but I was not a lady, right? <laughs> So um, it's, not, it's not the end of the world, but it does definitely rankle when somebody addresses me um, in a group as part of ladies. And I've got actually a little, a couple of exceptions that, that talk about that a little more. Thanks so much for that question. So there's a bunch of stuff around that and none of it will seem obvious at first, but when you do the research, you'll discover, oh, wait a minute, there's all these implications I didn't realize. So I just wanna go over a couple of big picture points that are about terminology. Um, the first one is, uh, if you make a mistake, that's totally fine. Just apologize, correct yourself, and move on. Uh, I think I've got, so I've personally decided to um, 
remove you guys from my vocabulary. Uh, it's been about five years. I think I've mostly done it, but if I say you guys, please um, interrupt me, raise the hand, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so um, it, it did take me five years. It took me three years to get it out of my written language and then another <laughs> two years to get it out of my spoken language. Uh, so you're not gonna change your language in this workshop. Uh, and you can pick specific things that you wanna work on and work on those or not uh, and let other people know what they are. Uh, but just apologize, correct yourself, move on. Uh, second part uh, is that members of, of any marginalized group can agree to call themselves whatever they want. Um, so this is uh, when you're part of a group, uh, there's a process you can go through called reclaiming where you take a slur uh, and you use it positively within that group and you know you're using it positively because everyone there is part of that group. Um, the important thing to remember is that you shouldn't assume that outsiders can use the same terms. Uh, so the example I use here is uh, Pi Ladies. It's a group for uh, women in Python. They've decided to call themselves Pi Ladies and they've requested other people call them Pi Ladies. Uh, and so in that case, uh, they get to decide to do that and they're asking other people to do it as well. Uh, there's other, other terms that are, have not been reclaimed yet and outsiders can't use. So a good example of a word that has been reclaimed is the word queer. Uh, I, it's a great, uh, useful term. Uh, many people are still, still, still familiar with the time when it was a, a slur, but it's been used within the queer community uh, over and over again to the point where um, it's now considered a positive by most queer people. All right, any questions? Okay, great. Thank you. I really appreciate questions. It makes this workshop much more interesting. <laughs> okay, um, so we're going to be trying to create a safer space. There's no such thing as a fully safe space. So here's the thing um, we're going to, here's the things we're going to do. So you can leave a return at any time for any reason without explaining. Uh, people usually have some sort of conference uh, or phone call they need to do. Um, or you might just need a break because uh, things are getting somewhat intense. It's fine. Uh, once this introduction is over, you can come and go as you please. Uh, I'm, I am the only person being recorded in this meeting. Uh, we went through all the options and figured out how to make it so that I'm the only person being recorded. Uh, what I'll do is I'll summarize what you've said uh, for the recording. Uh, the, the workshop is designed to be voluntary. If you're, you feel like you're here uh, uh, against your will or under pressure, uh, it's really easy to take advantage of that first item and just leave whenever you feel comfortable leaving. Uh, if, you, uh, if people tell sensitive stories in this workshop, please anonymize them if you repeat them elsewhere. And finally, I recommend sharing about at the level of people you just met at a conference. Um, if you feel super uncomfortable with sharing something or you haven't worked at, uh, through your feelings about it, it's okay for you just to not talk about it in this workshop. Okay. All right, we're going to do the basics of ally skills now. Um, so, uh, often people come into this thinking, oh, I really need to, uh, uh, when I'm acting as an ally, I need to come up with something that's super witty and funny and really convincing and it has like seven references and all that sort of stuff. And I'm here to tell you, no, you, you can just say anything as long as it's short, simple, and firm. So for example, you could say, uh, we don't do that here, uh, or not cool, uh, or even something as simple as just, wow. Uh, that's a, those are all ways to make it clear that uh, something is not acceptable. Uh, you're not trying to convince that person, you're just letting everyone know. Uh, I recommend not even trying to be funny. Uh, often people want to use humor to diffuse the situation, but it turns out that uh, when we try to be funny, in the moment when we're a little freaked out, we often come up with something that is oppressive and harmful and, and cruel to some group um, that we didn't realize. Sometimes even the group we're trying to help. So somebody says something sexist, someone will make a joke, it'll be actually homophobic or sexist itself. That's pretty common. So just take that burden off yourself. You don't even have to be funny. I think it's okay to be funny if uh, you have the time to get your joke clear, like reviewed or you have time to think about it or you can send it to a bunch of people and ask them what they think. Uh, I recommend playing for the audience. Uh, the per oftentimes the person who's just done something horrible is not open to changing their mind. Uh, but all the people around are, are looking at the two of you and saying, hmm, is this what we do around here? And if you say, no, we don't do that around here, they'll go, oh, yeah, we don't do that around here. It's much easier to change the mind of the audience in most cases. Uh, you get to practice your simple responses. So say you've decided to say, uh, we don't do that here. Uh, it's really hard to do that in the moment because you're a little freaked out uh, and, and nervous. 
So if you practice it when you're not nervous, when it's not happening, that'll really help. So when you're walking to work or when you're brushing your teeth, uh, when you're going to sleep at night, you can say to yourself, uh, we don't do that here. We don't do that here. We don't do that here. Uh, and then it'll become easier to say later on. Uh, finally, you get to uh, pick your battles. So oppression is happening everywhere, all around you. Um, if, you tried to, if, if you tried to object to everything you saw, you would immediately run out of energy. What we're trying to figure out in this workshop is uh, where you have the most power and influence and to act in those moments. I think it's really helpful to pick some battles, even if they're small and even if you think you're not going to win them, just because it gives you practice, right? Uh, so practicing uh, at the grocery store saying something will help you uh, say something when you're at work. But in general, you get to choose uh, when to take action. So I just want to expand a little bit uh, on something I touched on with the don't be funny idea. Uh, when you're trying to help one group, make sure you're not hurting another group. So uh, when you're taking action, ask yourself, uh, is this sexist? Is it homophobic? Is it transphobic? Racist? Ableist? Classist? Ageist? Are you body shaming anyone? Uh, I, I promise you, whatever problem you have with someone, it's not with their body. Uh, and finally, just don't describe people as sexually undesirable or unattractive as a way to say, oh, you are a bad person because of your opinions. Uh, there's plenty of people who are sexually unattractive uh, for reasons other than their horrible opinions, um, and they have no control over that. Uh, and there's plenty of people who are awful people who uh, are sexually attractive. So it's just not a helpful thing to do to shame people for that. Okay, right, any questions on that one? Excellent, yes, playing for the audience is, uh, once you get that clear in your head, you'll be much more effective. Uh, I, I, you, may be, you may have done this in your life, like tried to change someone's mind who's really convinced, and it turns out you wasted that hour and a half. Yeah, uh, that hour and a half is much better spent on the audience. <laughs> the question is, uh, uh, something oppressive has just happened, and most of the people in the group laughed, and it's possibly because they're just nervous about it. Um, what could you do in that situation? Because it's really hard to say, oh, not cool. Um, so I highly recommend getting comfortable uh, with making things more uh, awkward for the right person. So we'll talk a little bit about that with um, uh, the Captain Awkward uh, blog. Uh, one of the techniques you can use in the situation where everyone is laughing is, uh, especially if you laughed yourself, you can say like, oh, I just laughed because that was so uncomfortable. Uh, another thing you can do is say, I don't get it. Could you explain why that's funny? Uh, because a lot of times people won't want to say outright, oh, that's funny because we have a stereotype um, that uh, all women are stupid, right? Or something like that. Uh, and it's, it's tough, um, but boy, once you get in the habit of um, going ahead and doing the thing, even though it's awkward, it, it'll give you enormous advantages in other places. For example, uh, it's a really amazing superpower when you're negotiating your salary if you're comfortable with awkward silences, so. Okay, so uh, usually at this point we're feeling a little uncomfortable, a little awkward because I've been talking about all these tough things like transphobia and uh, racism and things like that. So I just like to have a little break here where we look at cute fennec foxes are my favorite fox. Uh, I don't care what that fox rating thread on Twitter said, it gave fennec foxes a three out of five. They're the best fox, they are a 10 out of five. Um, and these are all Creative Commons photos. Uh, you can get more on Wikipedia if you want. Uh, the other thing I like about fennec foxes is they have enormous ears and an important ally skill is listening uh, to people, which we will practice today in our discussions. So, all right, I hope you enjoyed your fennec foxes. I did. Okay, uh, so I call this dreaded group forming time uh, because I, as uh, uh, I hate group work in, um, uh, corporate training and was always a terrible, terrible student in these things. But I just want to let you all know, um, everyone here is here voluntarily and because they want to make a world a better place. So I think your group will be awesome and you'll enjoy it. Uh, so I'm going to uh, use the, the Zoom feature to split you up into groups. Um, you're going to get a little pop-up that invites you to join the room. Uh, and you'll be able to introduce yourselves and uh, do a couple of tasks that I'll, I'll be giving you in a second. Um, when you, uh, uh, you'll get a, a little, when I close the breakout rooms, you'll get a 60 second warning. Just keep talking until you are booted out into the group. Don't accept the return. Don't click on the thing that tells you to go back to the main group. Uh, and just a quick reminder, please don't sign out during the breaks. Just hit yourself on mute and, and, and turn off the video. Uh, otherwise your name will reset 
uh, to not have your pronoun in it, and that'll make it really hard for me. So. All right, once you're in your groups, um, uh, uh, you're gonna need to choose a gatekeeper. Uh, so uh, this is because online, so in general, there, you'll need a gatekeeper for meetings. What happens in uh, online discussion is that it, people tend towards not speaking at all. Uh, in, in person, they tend towards speaking too much. Uh, the gatekeeper has two jobs, uh, interrupt people who are speaking too much and invite people to speak when they aren't talking as much. Uh, you'll do a lot more of inviting people to speak. So when you get into the group, just uh, kick things off. So you'll pick this person when I put you in your groups in a moment. Also, at the beginning of each scenario, um, you're going to choose someone to take notes and report out what you said uh, during the discussion, just the top level uh, bits. This person should change every, every discussion you have. All right, so I'm going to... Um, put you into your breakout rooms, and this always takes a minute, I'm sorry. Wow, okay, so I'm just gonna summarize this for the, because you're not being recorded. Uh, so um, uh, you suggested saying something like, that sounds like what so-and-so said, uh, that's fantastic, that's really great. Uh, then thinking about what that person, why that one person was listened to and another person wasn't, and uh, what kind of patterns there might be there. Uh, to lean into asynchronous uh, communication more. So uh, I think that means things like uh, using more chat more often or um, finding ways to communicate ahead of the meeting. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, when that first person has spoken the original time, uh, repeat what they said and uh, affirm it and uh, praise it. So uh, great, that covers a lot of different things. It's really wonderful. So this group added um, that they talked about the privilege of, of leading the, uh, group, the group, of being the person who's leading the meeting, uh, and that means that they have more responsibility. Uh, it doesn't mean that only the leader has responsibility, but the leader has more responsibility to make sure credit is given correctly and to uh, encourage people uh, to, uh, to talk and to acknowledge uh, that they've spoken. So that's really great. So, uh, so, so uh, from this group, they added uh, uh, that you, you can ask the first person, uh, oh, is that what you meant? Uh, and you can also pass the mic to them and say, um, do you want to elaborate further? And that gives them the op option to say, yes, I would like that. Uh, uh, or they can say, no, I don't want to. Uh, so that's a super important ally skill is uh, uh, not speaking for someone, but giving them the opportunity to speak without forcing them to speak. So, great. Uh, this is the answer to a lot of people's questions about like, oh, how do I be an ally without being overbearing or speaking over someone? Um, this is the big point. If, if being the center of attention is good, uh, then you should, you should make room for and give uh, the target the opportunity to speak. Uh, and the way you do that is you say, hey, would you like to speak? So, great. Okay. So this group added on uh, uh, slowing the conversation down, uh, having more pauses, uh, having in the, in the discussion, uh, having more structure for the meeting, uh, including having someone taking notes and optionally recording the meeting as well, so you can go back. Uh, that, these are really good points. Uh, an important thing to keep in mind is uh, people have different lengths of time that they wait until somebody else, uh, until somebody speaks uh, before they feel like they have a chance to speak after someone has stopped speaking. So. Uh, Often, if you find that you are speaking a lot or you speak more, much more than the other people in your group, uh, if you wait a little bit longer for other people to speak, that will really help. Uh, the taking notes is fantastic, of course, uh, and recording is just another method of doing that. Also, I've, I really think a good figure. point, uh, this group added uh, talking about collaboration and making sure that if multiple people are building an, uh, on an idea, making sure that everyone gets credit for it. It's so super important. Um, oftentimes people will say something like, oh, it's not important who gets credit. What's important is that it gets done or that um, the, the idea gets implemented or that our company has the advantage or whatever it is. Uh, it's actually really important to give credit uh, appropriately um, or be very, very uh, careful about giving credit correctly. In particular, the way that privilege works is uh, if we're vague about who has the credit or the credit is not carefully assigned, uh, we will assume that the person who fits our stereotype uh, is the person who should get the credit. So you might have had this experience, uh, especially if you're in a position of privilege, of people saying, oh, clearly you did that thing. And you're like, no, I didn't. I've told you three times who did the thing. 
Uh, and it's just the way that our brains work that, that we forget, we assume, uh, we remember things differently uh, based on our stereotypes, right? So it's actually, if you care about diversity and inclusion, it's really important uh, to give credit uh, accurately. The other important thing about giving credit accurately is that it, um, uh, when credit is vague or it's easy to steal, it attracts people who are harmful, uh, people who like to steal credit. And this is absolutely a real thing that happens. People refuse to believe it, but there's a reason that plagiarism is a word. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you are very careful about giving credit, um, you will make your company unattractive uh, to people who like to steal credit. All right, that was really super great. Cool. So this group added um, uh, you, that you can validate ideas from both people uh, involved um, and that there's a good chance that the second person didn't hear the first person. Uh, so giving them the benefit of the doubt there, uh, but keeping in mind, like, why is it that they didn't hear it? Um, and in particular, asking uh, what if uh, the same person is doing this over and over again, like saying something that someone else said as though they were the first, first person to think about it. Um, so checking in with other people to see if they're seeing the same pattern uh, and then uh, perhaps uh, doing something about that, which they didn't get time to get, uh, get to. But I would suggest that you can uh, talk to somebody's manager is one option. Uh, so uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the benefit of the doubt thing. Uh, this thing, which multiple of you talk, uh, touched on, and I just want to expand a little bit about what you were saying, uh, that it is entirely possible the second person was not paying attention or didn't hear or didn't understand the first person. And I see this come out in various forms of like, maybe one person is just better at explaining things. Uh, maybe one person has, um, uh, it speaks more loudly. Uh, with this particular scenario about someone being hard of hearing, people can say things like, oh, maybe they uh, weren't speaking up loudly enough, they couldn't tell that they weren't speaking up. Um, and the answer there is uh, actually that one way that oppression shows itself is people will not pay attention uh, when somebody is speaking that they think is not important. So this is absolutely a thing that happens. Uh, uh, and it is documented in the research. So it can be true, both that somebody didn't mean to, to uh, steal someone else's idea, and also that they're acting in a biased way uh, at a subconscious level. That they're just not listening. They're deliberately not paying attention. Uh, they went and checked their email because this when that person's speaking, they think that they don't have anything to say. All right. Okay, so uh, that is a super good report out. You, um, you caught the, the main things to do there. Uh, most important is to say in the moment, uh, uh, oh, I think that's similar to so-and-so's idea, then pass the mic to that person. So-and-so, uh, would you like to expand on that some more? Uh, to prevent it, you can, uh, when the first person is speaking, uh, to say, oh, I think that's a good idea. Uh, can we hear more about that? or um, some sort of affirming thing that's, that says, hey, you, talk, you spoke, I heard, and uh, I think other people should pay attention to. Uh, the other thing that a lot of you talked about was more structure, and there's a particular form of meeting structure I recommend to people. Uh, this is uh, the, having specific meeting roles at each meeting. So the roles are facilitator. Uh, this is the person who keeps the discussion moving forward. Um, I'm filling that role. Uh, timekeeper, that's the person who's tracking how much time you're spending on each topic uh, and reminds people to move on. I'm also filling that role here. Uh, the note taker is the person writing down what everyone has said so that you can re uh, remember it in the future. So we've got that person doing that. Uh, and the gatekeeper is someone who interrupts when people are speaking too much and invites people who aren't speaking as much uh, to, to speak. So you can do a bunch of other structure, uh, things like you can have, um, uh, make an agenda before the meeting. You can have two minutes at the for each person at the beginning of the meeting to say what they need to, uh, what they'd like to talk about. Uh, there's a bunch of other ways to to do that kind of structure. Uh, I just want to make a quick note about the note taker role. Um, while the note taker has a lot of power in that they can record what happened and what the decisions are and who said something first, make sure credit gets assigned correctly. Uh, they also aren't able to participate fully in the meeting. Uh, so. This is a, um, that's why I recommend rotating the role of note taker. There's things like Slack bots that can assign the role randomly or rotate it through. Uh, and it's super important to make sure that your note taker is not always the person uh, with the least privilege in the group. 
All right, any comments? On yeah, so uh, the question is, should you always rotate the roles or, or, or are some people uh, better at a role? Are they better because they're naturally better or are they better because um, they get more practice because they've been assigned that role more often? Uh, so I, I don't think it's necessary to rotate all of the roles. In particular, the facilitator is often going to be the person with um, the, the best knowledge of an area, and that's, that's more difficult to move around. It's also a more difficult skill. Uh, timekeeper, note taker, and gatekeeper, I think those can be rotated more. Uh, I think the only one that it's vital to rotate is the, is the note taker. Uh, otherwise, there's someone in the meeting, unless that, that is specifically their role uh, in the organization to take notes for meetings. Uh, if you're not rotating that, then you have somebody who's not able to participate. Uh, and yes, I would question, why is somebody better at this? Uh, so a thing I absolutely noticed in this workshop is that the gatekeeper and note taker are often um, the only person of color in the group, um, the only woman in the group, uh, that sort of thing. So it's an important thing to become aware of. All right, any other questions? Yeah, um, so facilitator is more about uh, shepherding the discussion and moving the discussion through the various topics, right? Uh, so their, their focus is on um, sort of the content of the meeting. Uh, and uh, the, I think it's, you don't have, so uh, someone can have multiple roles, they can have all of this, all of the roles. Uh, I think it's really helpful to split them out when possible. Uh, one of the things that a gatekeeper has to do is actually pay attention to how long people are speaking. Uh, and it's tough to do that and also keep track of the total time and also keep track of um, uh, the content of the discussion at the same time. So facilitator is more about uh, content and running through the topics and, and uh, gatekeeper is more about making sure everyone gets a turn. The facilitator should be aware of this and they should also stop people talking, especially if they're getting off topic, right? Yeah, so the question is, uh, uh, do I have any experience with organizations that record their meetings uh, by audio or tra transcribe the audio into automatically into a uh, written form? Um, uh, because uh, taking notes is really difficult and it is very, uh, it is hard to participate in the meeting. And so it's, uh, it, it feels unfair to assign that to anyone. Uh, so yeah, the um, recording and transcribing, the problem with that is that it's not a condensed form. What you want to get out of the meeting is something you can look through and find, oh, here are the action items, here's the, here are the decisions we made, uh, here's the things that I want to, to take home from this. Um, the issue, uh, so one of the ways to mitigate the burden on the note taker is to use a shared note taking uh, document. So Google Docs has a really strong shared mode. Uh, and that way you can have a system where uh, you swap between two people taking notes depending on who's speaking. So uh, while the note taker is speaking, someone else will take notes uh, and then they can switch back to taking notes. Uh, or they can have some sort of system where they, they trade off. Uh, so that really cuts down on the burden of note taking a lot. Other people will often go back and like edit the notes at live in the meeting uh, because they're not, you know, they're not participating. They don't need to be fully paying attention at that moment. So, so. After a little bit of reflection. So what we're doing in this workshop is um, uh, we're practicing what we're learning. And in particular, we're practicing, are we taking turns in a meeting? Are we listening to other people? So I'm just asking you to take a moment to think about who's speaking the most in your group? Is anyone having difficulty being heard? Uh, are there any patterns related to gender, race, age, or anything else? And how do these discussions compare to ones you have in other contexts? Uh, do you like them more or less? Uh, so if you go in, I just, if there's one thing you get out of this workshop, I'd love for you to start paying attention to who's speaking and for how long. So. All right, here's your next scenario. Um, on a company Slack channel, a coworker responds to a suggestion of yours with, that's so gay, uh, and a smiley face emoji. So just to be clear, um, uh, they're saying that's a bad, they're jokingly saying that's a bad thing. They're using the word gay to mean bad. Uh, and then there's, they're indicating that they're just being ironic about it. They don't really mean it by using the smiley face uh, emoji. Uh, what could you do as an ally in this situation? Uh, any questions before I send you off? Cool. All right. So uh, uh, th this group first discussed about whether to talk to someone on a private channel. Uh, but then they remembered the guideline to speak to the audience and said, oh, probably we should do this in public. Uh, just to note that seeing something written is often different than hearing it spoken. And it, I think the point there is that it's even more intense. Uh, 
uh, it's easier to make a mistake when you're uh, speaking out loud, when you're writing something, you, you can see it in front of you. Uh, and so it's like even more important to respond. Um, you can ask them, hey, did you intend to be harmful? Uh, and this is, this is a, a pretty good approach to be like, hey, I don't know if you knew this, but when you said that, uh, it had this effect. Is that what you wanted? Um, you can also suggest a different uh, word um, uh, because and, uh, uh, for that person to use. Uh, you can also do that in the form of like, hey, you know, I just, I've started saying this word instead of that word for this reason. Um, that, uh, they mentioned that because uh, uh, you might want to say a different word because it, other people, it might be making other people uncomfortable. I just want to give you a little tip here. It's so useful when acting as an ally. Um, you never want to say other people would be hurt by that word or other people would be harmed or other people are uncomfortable because that allows them to say, oh yeah, which people? Then they go ask those people. Uh, and a target is in a situation where they have to get involved in, in an argument. Uh, and it's much easier for targets to say, look, I don't care. This happens to me all day. I'm, I don't, that word doesn't bother me, right? So if you want to win this argument, I highly recommend saying, um, hey, when you say that word, it makes me uncomfortable because of my values of being inclusive to this group of people, right? So you're saying, I'm the person who's uncomfortable. And they can't come to you and say, you know, you're not. You're not uncomfortable. <laughs> and you're in a much better position to, to be honest about your feelings because you have more privilege. Right? Uh, finally, there's just a, a, a note that there's, um, you can uh, program Slack bots uh, to automatically remind you uh, when um, you've said a particular word or not. Uh, uh, and suggest an alternative. Um, I highly recommend having this set up uh, uh, in a way such that either everybody knows in advance, like they've gotten a piece of paper that tells them, hey, we don't use these words, and if you do, Blackbot's going to um, tell you a different word to use. Um, or you can set it up so that people can opt, uh, opt out of it, right? Uh, so by default, everyone gets a I would suggest a private uh, notification from Slackbot saying like, hey, by the way, you said that word that you don't want to say. And, and if a person's like, I want to say this word, um, they can go ahead and turn it off. Uh, but uh, they know for sure that other people have found this uh, harmful uh, and have to make that decision. All right. Uh, so so this, this group came up with a lot of the same stuff and also said uh, that they talked a lot about public versus private feedback, in particular uh, that there's a company value of giving people the benefit of the doubt and allowing them to save face, uh, uh, but that it's really important to, uh, for members of target groups to see the challenge in public, to know that they are um, being supported. So that make, I agree with that, that last point, and I would also add um, uh, that uh, it it's, gives everyone a sense of what's acceptable uh, going on. Uh, the other thing is that I just want to talk a little bit about the benefit of the doubt and intent uh, and things like that. Often you see this in the form of like assume positive intent or assume good intent. Uh, there's a problem with requiring people to do that or get, always giving people the benefit of the doubt. And it's that it, it puts a lot of burden on targets. So uh, having an, being a target means you've had a lot of experience with people uh, unintentionally or intentionally harming you a lot, right? So uh, uh, for example, um, if you're a person of color, you might face a lot of stereotypes where people are constantly deliberately trying to hurt you uh, by assuming negative things about you uh, or saying those things about you. Uh, and when you have a company value of saying you should always give someone the benefit of the doubt, it's saying, hey, targets, um, you don't get to use your experience in the world. Uh, you don't get to protect yourselves. You have to always go into every experience as though it's the first one and that you have no, uh, no way of coping or preventing or uh, uh, saving yourself from being hurt again. Uh, so there's actually a great uh, article, which I believe is in the handout, called um, How uh, Good Intent uh, Harms Diversity and Inclusion, and it talks a lot about these issues. So it does make sense. Uh, the place where people, it's really good to have some sort of assumed positive intent when you limit it to this very specific situation, which is keep in mind uh, that certain me methods of communication leave out a lot of emotional context. And uh, if you may assume that things are worse than they actually are, uh, uh, just because you don't have enough information. But that's a different than, hey, I've seen this situ situation a million times before when somebody says, 
um, oh, I assumed that you would take the notes. What they're really saying is, I assume that you were not important for this meeting, right? It's an important, important thing to keep in mind. Okay, so this group said that, um, that their first instinct is to direct message this person and then have some sort of just public feedback in the main uh, session. So um, this, is one of, this is actually one of those situations where people come in and say, they often come in and think, well, do I talk to them privately or do I say something publicly? And sometimes the answer is you can do both. Uh, the ideal situation here is that um, this person respects your opinion uh, and that you know that they, are, they have a value of being inclusive. If that's the case, um, it is great to DM them and just be like, hey, uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but when you said this thing, I just want to let you know that it was harmful uh, to this group uh, and you know, I thought you might care about that. Um, the, uh, uh, and then in the ideal situation, that person will say, oh, thank you so much. Um, I didn't realize that. I'm going to go edit my comments to remove that uh, and say that I'm sorry on the main channel and that happens, right? That's the ideal situation. Uh, if you don't know this person well, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's not a great idea to, to DM them, right? So imagine how you would feel if somebody uh, you didn't know at all or didn't respect uh, it, privately letting you know, hey, you might not want to use that word and you, you don't have any context on that word or that person, right? And um, so in that case, I think it makes more sense to say in the channel something like, hey, uh, do you mean this word? Um, I try to avoid using that word because it's harmful. Uh, they talked, uh, the script talked a bit about discussion around uh, saving, uh, saving face, allowing people to save face. Uh, and that's totally a reasonable thing uh, to do. Uh, it's just important to prioritize it, right? So um, some situations it's really important to jump in right away and say hey we don't do that here uh, uh, in order to to set set the value really quickly uh, other situations there's more time and you can give somebody an opportunity to save save face so i think that was the, sort of the outcome of that discussion in general was we need to think about more than one thing it's not saving allowing some to save face is not the most important value uh, there's other values like being inclusive that you need to balance with that so that's a great point. Um, I just actually wrote an article for uh, Project Include uh, about how civility can harm uh, diversity and inclusion in uh, 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 tech companies. In particular, it talks about taking the value of civility and putting that into context and giving it a different priority relative to being inclusive. So um, uh, talking a little bit about allowing people to share without judgment is a, is a strong value as well. And then, and then saying like, oh, maybe we should actually reconsider that, that we do want there to be a line uh, and that um, uh, it, it might be useful to rethink that, uh, that there needs to be some kind of balance between people feeling safe saying whatever and, and people actually, they're actually being a line of actually you shouldn't feel safe saying that. You should feel like oh, that's not safe to say. So I, I agree. I think whenever it comes to things like openly expressing bigotry, um, uh, using really harmful language, like those are things that people shouldn't feel safe about. Uh, there are obviously all these ways to do so more productively. So there's some conversation on, on the uh, uh, text channel I just want to get to. I, I had it covered up by the participants and didn't see it initially. So talking briefly about um, if you allow people to have Slack bot reminders be private. So that's the thing about a Slack bot reminder um, uh, is that it can allow you to do, set up your own accountability where you have that chance to save, save face. Uh, so um, I think part of the thing that's annoying about that people find annoying about Slack bot reminders and that turns them off is that it's happening to them publicly and they don't have a way to, 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 to opt in, right? Um, if you have it a, a set up so that um, it, it's on by default and it tells people privately by default, uh, that there's less of that, oh, I'm being constantly being, like I feel like I can never type in the channel without something happen, happening. Um, it's really gonna depend on, I think, the word in particular. There's certain words that you're just, you're gonna want to like immediate, public, stop, uh, and then there's like a conversation with somebody's manager if, if they keep using that word. There's other words, um, like for example, I personally am trying not to say guys. Uh, I do think that that's uh, a, something that somebody has to commit to themselves if they want to change it. Uh, and I, uh, I, would, I would recommend more of a, uh, an opt-out private sort of situation for that. Uh, let's see, other comments on here. Um, uh, there's some discussion about uh, uh, the, um, 
about whether somebody is a bad person for doing something and, and that we, we could assume that uh, people aren't bad when they're doing these things. That's um, uh, uh, less, the role of intent is not about, so here's where intent comes into play. It helps you figure out how to address the situation um, and who, how that person is likely to behave in the future. So if somebody uh, did not intend to be harmful, it's more likely that they are going to change their behavior in the future. Uh, I just want to be clear, there's an often an assumption when I do this workshop that nobody is intentionally being bad. That is not true. Uh, there are literally people who are part of online hate groups, including white supremacist groups and misogynist groups, who deliberately talk about their um, techniques for going, becoming an employee of a company and harming the people inside of that company, right? So that's the thing to keep in mind. Right, yeah, so um, this, this group wanted to uh, talk more about doing something in public. Uh, so I, I'll, I will just say all of this stuff aside, um, uh, you should do something in public. The question is how much you do privately first, uh, and that really depends on your connection with the person who's speaking and what you know about them. So. Uh, that that group is saying this is a good opportunity to educate that person about why. Um, I just want to note that it's okay for you to speak up in this moment when you don't have the time or energy to educate. Uh, it depends on how much energy you have. Uh, it's okay if it, all you can do is say like, "Hey, we don't say that here." That's great. If you if you're up to saying, "Hey, we don't say that here," and here's why, that's great as well. Great. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so this group suggested first, um, one of the things you could do is ask, uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, I don't understand. Uh, and this is a super useful technique to use uh, in this situation when somebody is uh, being sort of more obscurely offensive, that there's an assumption that's hidden, right? Uh, and so often uh, you can force that person to come out and say, well, that's gay. I said that because um, <laughs> being being gay is bad and this is also bad and so I was trying to but I was being joking about it so I'm not serious about it uh, often people can't explain uh, why a thing is is there uh, and all your what you're doing which is effective uh, is um, making people feel awkward and uncomfortable about using that word uh, even if they don't understand all the details of what's going on there so that's a reasonable thing to do um, the one thing I, I, I let people know is that you shouldn't do this if there's a member of the target group present uh, because they have heard this over and over again. Like they have had long, frustrating, uh, you know, like tear inducing conversations about um, where somebody's explaining to them why it's okay to use uh, gay in this pejorative manner. Uh, and they don't need to hear it again. So that's the kind of thing uh, keep in mind uh, when you're doing that. Uh, the other comment from this group is they're talking about how um, some terms uh, are uh, okay in one culture. Uh, or part of that culture and are offensive uh, or harmful in another culture. Uh, and so this is where having a company culture is really important, right? So everyone is coming from a different place in a different culture. Uh, and what is important is that you clearly define what your company culture is and you say, hey, this takes priority over any individual person's culture. So we have a scenario that's more about that in a moment um, uh, after the break. Uh, uh, but that that's basically what it comes down to. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Okay, right. Yeah, so the question uh, here is, uh, uh, would you, if somebody made the statement in Slack, would you leave it there later on for other people to see when they joined? Um, and would that tell them that the wrong message about your company? So this is why I say that there always needs to be some public response. So the public response could look like uh, the person who originally said it uh, silently editing it. Uh, that's a great solution. Um, it could be there's a discussion after it that says, hey, we don't use that word because of this reason. Uh, it, and the ideal thing um, is, is somebody correcting it uh, at some level. So uh, sometimes the administrator can go and edit it or delete it is one of the options there. So yeah, don't, uh, when something like this happens, don't allow it to continue. Uh, or allow it to, to go down into history as like, oh, this is what we do around here. I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind with this kind of scenario. Uh, what, will, what will other people conclude about our culture uh, if they hear about this or see it? All right. uh, just a quick tip, uh, Captain Awkward is an advice blog for people who, um, for whom social interaction is not just super easy. It's like something that you had to learn. Uh, it's really great for these kind of questions where um, 
you're like, oh, I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable or I don't want to upset anyone. Uh, the most important thing to keep in mind is uh, that somebody's already upset. Uh, somebody is already being hurt. Uh, what Captain Awkward says is somebody's just thrown the beach ball of awkward. You've caught the beach ball of awkward. Uh, you get to throw it back to the person who threw it in the first place uh, and make them feel awkward again. Uh, so whenever you're in this kind of situation, you're thinking, oh, I don't want to make this person uncomfortable or upset. Remember, somebody else is already uncomfortable or upset, and they are the target of that situation. So, okay, so this is the next scenario, which I'll quickly go through uh, later on. You might want to look at the paradox of tolerance during the break. Scenario is going directly to question, the question a lot of you were asking and discussing recently. Uh, so a colleague of yours consistently uses male pronouns to refer to software and people of unknown gender. Uh, when you tell them it makes you uncomfortable to treat maleness as the norm, they say that male is the default gender in their first language and you should be more considerate of people from other cultures. Uh, so just a note here that uh, some people believe that uh, English has a default gender of male. Um, this is actually a, a thing that people have been trying to make happen for several centuries, but has never been true. <laughs> also, uh, there's a, a movement in many languages that are gendered, the strongly gendered to uh, uh, create a more gender neutral form of that language. So language is constantly evolving. Uh, none of us is speaking medieval Latin uh, or Roman Latin. Uh, medieval Latin is different than Roman Latin, uh, for example. So uh, any questions on this one? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, that, that's the scenario here is that you're having, you're, you were having that conversation of, hey, we are one in one. Um, I'm sharing with you how, how this makes me feel. Great, okay. Um, so the, this group is talking about how uh, the overall company culture needs to take precedence, uh, that if you're creating an inclusive uh, company culture that's that has to take precedence over other people's background if their background includes, some, includes something that's not inclusive. Uh, there's a suggestion about while you're having this one-on-one -on -one conversation to um, ask, ask them and listen to them about uh, their background and uh, how it's different. Uh, there's a, a worry that this might make them feel othered or excluded more because you're focusing on the differences. Um, uh, and that, that you really need to get back to at some point this idea of uh, that there's this company culture and, and then that, that's what counts. Uh, so I'll let other, I'm gonna let the other groups talk first, uh, but there is some sort of something similar to that that won't have that result. So we'll talk about it in a minute. Cool, so this group was, was talking also about learning from each other, uh, find, asking more information about them, trying to find out where the other person is coming from. Um, but coming, coming back to this sort of, uh, conflict here, what's inclusive for one person is exclusive for another person. Uh, and that's, that's where the paradox of tolerance really comes into play. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. Like, how do you figure out what to include? Uh, my short version is like, you don't have to be inclusive of bigotry, right? Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about how you figure out what's bigotry and all that stuff. Um, uh, and then just again, how important it is to have the company culture that you can fall back on and say, this takes precedence. All right, group number three, anything you'd like to add? And it's fine if the other groups have already talked about what you've talked about. Great, cool. All right, so this group talked about a lot of what the other groups talked about. Um, uh, they talked more about like uh, explaining uh, that this is in, uh, trying to create a more inclusive environment. Uh, they also talked about the various different ways that people will gender objects, either because of their language or uh, because it's a, um, a convention. For example, there's a, a convention which varies between different English-speaking countries about uh, giving gender to um, uh, ships and boats and things like that. So, okay, so uh, this group talked about a lot of the other things the other groups talked about, and they talked about uh, um, saying, saying uh, hey, when you use these words, I feel uncomfortable, which is a great uh, technique to use because you can't fall back to like, well, it's the language or it's this other person. You're just saying, I feel uncomfortable. And that's just true. Uh, uh, some notes about not attacking their worldview. Um, I, I think there, I mean, you, you may, their worldview may be uh, that uh, men are better than women, for example, uh, or that men should be the default uh, when we think about things. Uh, so that is like an, an unacceptable worldview. Uh, however, I like the, the, the way that I look at it is um, you were focusing on that person's behavior. You don't have to change how they think uh, what you're, as long as you change how they behave. Uh, it, sometimes that's the only thing that you can achieve uh, and it's, um, 
uh, more achievable than changing how someone thinks. It's also definitely possible that after someone has behaved in a certain way for a while, they'll, they'll say, oh, wow, you know, I do think about gender differently. I do no longer think that male should be the default because once I started using these other terms, uh, my, the way I thought uh, of, about people and things really changed. So, uh, but yeah, it's, you can get, get someone's behavior to change uh, without changing their worldview. That's acceptable. Uh, great. Uh, next group. Um, all right. Uh, so this group talked about a lot of the things the other groups talked about. Uh, they said that uh, this company in particular is very specifically multicultural. Uh, and so that's, that's a really important thing. Um, you can have a company culture, which is inclusive of multiple cultures. It's inclusive of the parts uh, that are inclusive of other people, right? So uh, there's a lot of things that are uh, that you can include and make be part of the culture and, and be acceptable um, that don't harm other people. Uh, and that's very different than having one culture that dominates everything. Uh, there's sort of this, uh, and that doesn't per permit or tolerate like benign, reasonable, or positive things from, other, from uh, uh, different cultures. So multicultural is great and it is better than one culture. You still need to have an overall company culture which takes precedence on these things uh, which are harmful. Uh, so, uh, just noticing, noting that uh, sometimes using the, the wrong word or doing a thing is an accident, um, and that uh, giving people the room to apologize, correct themselves, and move on is uh, really a really great thing to do, and you really want to normalize that behavior, that it's normal for people to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I meant blah blah and then continue the conversation. Uh, some folks mentioned that this feels very real, uh, especially uh, people who are women. Uh, and just a question like, what can you do if you are the target in this situation? In this case, that would be uh, um, if you are a woman or if you are a non-binary person or if you use um, uh, non-standard non pronouns. Uh, the answer here is like, yeah, this is not your job. <laughs> um, I highly recommend that if you do want to take action as a target, that you go and find somebody who is in a position to act as an ally and ask them uh, to take some action. Great. Okay, um, so this group uh, said a lot of the things as the other groups. Uh, they talked about asking questions like, um, uh, we're speaking English and uh, male is not the default in that language. So I have bad news for you. A number of people think that is true and there was a long movement uh, over the last, I think, couple of centuries to try to make male the default. Uh, so I, it's, you, I, I Highly, uh, you, you can't fall back on a, oh, this is the way the language is kind of argument. Um, you have to say, hey, we're trying to create a more inclusive culture. This is an important part of our company culture. Uh, and it takes precedence over any culture that anyone came from. Um, I talked a little bit about using uh, male pronouns, like maybe it's different to use, if you use them for objects uh, versus people. Uh, uh, there is, a, I, w I won't say they're identical, um, but they have the same effect of saying like, hey, uh, male is normal and uh, female or non-binary uh, is uh, exceptional, right? Uh, so even if it's for an object, you want to avoid using uh, male, male pronouns as the default. And in general, gen gendering ob objects is uh, something you want to avoid either way. Uh, of course, this is going to have limitations based on the language, and that's part of why the, it's so important to support the work of various people who are working to make their languages less gendered. Uh, finally, um, just noting that this is a pretty aggressive response, um, uh, and I agree with that. Uh, this is someone who's not ready to listen. Uh, uh, this is someone who might later on change their mind. Uh, I'm not sure that it, it makes a lot of sense to have a, uh, a discussion or a debate with this person or to get them to do critical thinking. Like, well, what if, um, one of the suggestions was you can ask, well, what if uh, uh, someone comes from a culture where female is the default? Um, gender for, for people and, and things. Uh, first, there's going to be, it's not equivalent because there's no context of systemic oppression against men in any culture I've ever studied. People always send, send me and say, oh no, here's a truly matriarchal culture. And I'm like, really? Because the, all of the politicians are still men and uh, they own all the things that are not land. <laughs> so uh, there's no context of that, right? So it, it might be an interesting thought experiment for people to go through, but it's not going to be convincing. Uh, so um, a thing that uh, nobody has mentioned that sometimes does work here, uh, and this is something I recommend doing 
thinking about as an option if you're an ally uh, is to share your own vulnerability, uh, to be vulnerable to that person. So saying something like, yeah, I, if, if it is true for you, I also used to wonder about that, or I also used to use uh, uh, male pronouns uh, because I thought that that was what English grammar meant, uh, that that was the rule. And then I read more about the history of English and understood that this was actually not true and that people for a very long time had used uh, plural they, them uh, pronouns uh, for many, many centuries. And it was a, you know, a recent change. Uh, so you can share your own experience or, or something like, hey, I used to do that. And then somebody, a friend of mine said, hey, I think that you're not talking about me when you talk about that. Or you, I think that I'm a, a second class citizen when you say that. Uh, and that really changed my mind because I don't want to hurt that person. So that's the kind of thing that, that can be really valuable in this situation and can get someone to come back down from a place of defensiveness. Not necessarily though, which is why um, the end result is it's really great to have things like this that are controversial, documented and written down uh, as part of your company culture. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over uh, the paradox of tolerance specifically here. Uh, to get a little more detail on like how do you, how do you figure out what things uh, should be excluded from your culture so the paradox of tolerance is this concept that if you're creating a tolerant society which is inclusive of a lot of people you have to be intolerant of one thing and that's intolerance itself right uh, so the problem is that if you were tolerant of intolerance say there's somebody who comes in and says uh, I believe uh, people of this race are genetically superior and should be leaders and should rule everyone else of all the other races uh, that's, that's intolerance based on a thing that's part of someone's identity um, that makes them a press group that there's a history of oppression against. You can't tolerate that because what will happen is uh, all the people who are not, who are bothered by that or hurt by that will leave. Uh, and in particular, that will be people of, who are not of that race. So um, multiculturalism is important. It is valuable. It's something uh, that needs to be done. Uh, it means including and welcoming different cultures and incorporating them into your company culture, but you leave out the parts that harm or exclude people based on their identity. Uh, so, and as you all pointed out, company culture takes precedence over other cultures uh, in, the, in the case of things that are harmful. Uh, any thoughts or questions on that one? Yeah, the question is basically, um, uh, can your company culture be biased or intolerant itself because it's shaped by a few people who are powerful? And the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, uh, you can have a company culture which um, is intolerant of things uh, in a way that um, uh, excludes people who are trans, for example, or excludes people who are disabled. Uh, and that's a thing to just keep, keep re-examining and listening uh, when people say, hey, this is making it hard for me. What you're trying to do is distinguish between people saying, hey, your company culture doesn't allow me to be intolerant and bigoted. And hey, your company culture uh, makes me feel othered and excluded based on my identity. Those are two different complaints. Uh, and so the paradox of tolerance helps you figure out which, which complaint you're getting. All right, next scenario. Okay, um, so looking at the section on race in your handout, I can't say the name, the words to use for uh, uh, every racial or ethnic group, but I've give you some ideas on how to figure it out. Um, so this is a, a slide uh, that's some, somewhat of a U.S. context in the context of anti-Black racism in the U.S. Um, a Black coworker points out on Slack that a recent company-wide meeting has all white presenters. Uh, several other people criticize them for being too abrasive, aggressive, loud, out of line, etc. cetera. Uh, so this is happening on Slack. Uh, any questions about this? So this group uh, separated this and said that there's there's two well separate, so that there are two specific issues here. Uh, one is that um, uh, there's an actual problem with the all white presenters uh, in the meeting, uh, and so one uh, the solution to that was to speak up and say uh, so that it's not all that just that you're a black coworker. You're saying hey, uh, this is not inclusive. This is not my values. This is not the company values, uh, and speaking up about that first original issue. Uh, then there's the second issue, which is how people reacted by criticizing the black coworker, uh, and this group wasn't uh, didn't have time to talk about that. So perhaps another group will. All right, great. Uh, group three. So the second group uh, said on that second issue that uh, that you should respond publicly and directly about how people are treating the black coworker uh, improperly. Uh, no, 
that if an, maybe another group will have suggestions about what to say when you respond publicly and directly. So group uh, number four. Great, okay, so that group said uh, you should show solidarity with your black coworker to speak up publicly and affirm what they're saying and say that this is a problem. Um, it's really helpful if part of, uh, it's part of company culture, you can bring in some form of part company culture to back them up. So if it's documented uh, that, um, for example, when we should support whistleblowers or um, uh, that we should have diversity represented at, at all levels or something like that. Um, pointing, someone pointing out this is measurable. It's a thing that you can count. Uh, just a quick note, sometimes people are passing as a member of a more pr privileged group and it's not obvious, uh, but within a company, uh, you get to know a lot about each other and um, in particular, if everyone is passing at white, as white, uh, that's still a problem if all of the presenters are white. So, uh, and finally that it's, we should not view this as the black coworkers job to fix this problem. Uh, it's actually the responsibility of allies in this situation to do the work to, to fix it. So, great, uh, that's real, all really good stuff. Group five, anything you'd like to add? Uh, so this group talked about uh, how sometimes when this stuff is happening in written form, it can be more intense, uh, in part because you can go back and read it over and over again. It just didn't happen in the movement or in the moment. Uh, they talked about the, that worked. Uh, they talked about the stereotype of the angry black person. So um, uh, in, in American culture, for sure, there's the stereotype of the angry black man, angry black woman, angry black person, where there's this idea that's, that um, people who are black are overreacting and are too angry and too mad about things. And so that uh, causes people to both overinterpret uh, somebody's level of upset if they are black and also to dismiss any anger coming from a black person or any any complaints whatsoever uh, so that's an important stereotype to be aware of and to not fall for and check whether you are having you are um, falling for that stereotype uh, they started talking about tone policing which is uh, an excellent thing to know about and we'll talk more about if another group um, doesn't go into that so that'll come soon all right, great. great. Uh, so this group talked about uh, having doing both public and private feedback. Uh, first part of pub the public feedback would be publicly su supporting your black coworker. Um, just to note that African American isn't identical to black. Um, it it works for a black person who is American, uh, but there are plenty of black people who are not. Um, uh, they suggested going to leadership and asking them to be an ally of the black person. So like specifically contacting. If you are a leader yourself and or contacting other leaders in the company and saying, hey, we really need to support this. That's a really fantastic idea. Um, and that you can give uh, private feedback uh, to the people in engaging in the, the criticism and say like, hey, did you know there's a stereotype of the angry black person? Uh, you might want to learn some more about it. Here's a, here's a link. Uh, and finally, a, a note about uh, ganging up uh, on an, an employee that the people who are criticizing your black coworker are ganging up on them and that that's bad. Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily say ganging up is always bad. Um, I would say there are certain ways of giving feedback uh, that are more effective and that are less effective. Uh, the issue here is that people are, are criticizing this person for doing the company a favor, like pointing out, hey, uh, your, the speakers at this meeting are not representative uh, of the company. Uh, if, if they are, we have a very serious problem if we're an all white company. Um, and that's the thing that you want to reward, not punish. Uh, so there, I think there are situations in which it is reasonable for a bunch of people to say, hey, wow, that's not acceptable. Um, this obviously is not one of them. So the, this group talked about a lot of the same issues and then also talked about the systematic issue, like going into detail on how did this happen in the first place and what do we need to fix uh, so that we don't have that happen again? And that this needs to be the responsibility of company uh, company leadership and people with pr privilege in this situation. So. Great. Okay. Um, there's just one thing I want to add here, uh, which is that, uh, and then I'll go into tone policing more as I promised, uh, which is um, one of the problems with this whole situation is that uh, it took a black person to point this out. Uh, what you really want is specifically uh, a white person to point this out. Um, uh, this is a, a super important ally skill if you can develop it is if you're in the if you are in the privileged group start counting uh, every time you go into a room uh, who's in who's in your privileged group and who is not 
uh, and if the answer is zero people who, uh, without that privilege in the room, there's a problem. Uh, so this, this should have been somebody in the company who was white speaking up and saying, hey, I noticed that we had all white presenters uh, because they were not going to get the, uh, some sort of stereotyped feedback about um, uh, being a person of color uh, or specifically in this case, uh, the angry black person stereotype. So uh, one group mentioned tone policing and I'm gonna go into a little more detail on that. So tone, what's happening here is called tone policing or people using the tone argument. So uh, when members of marginalized groups advocate for themselves or their ideas, um, it's violating the expectation that marginalized people should be submissive and quiet and accept things as they are and not complain, right? Um, there's that additional um, problem that some groups are stereotyped as inappropriately angry uh, there's even an issue with uh, most marginalized groups are expected to be supportive and happy and uh, um, caring for members of the privileged group. And so even somebody who's insufficiently happy and supportive and caring can be interpreted as angry uh, or, uh, you, you know, has a problem with their tone. So the interesting thing about tone policing is that uh, people almost always use the word tone when they're using it. Like, I don't like your tone or you better watch your tone or something like that. Uh, so just to be clear, it is possible for somebody to have uh, an uh, inappropriate tone. Um, it's just that it's far more likely that people are going to, to inappropriately use that argument uh, if it's a member of a marginalized group who's speaking up. So. All right, any questions about the tone argument or any other stuff we talked about? So the question is, what advice would I give to the black coworker? Uh, so basically, I don't give advice to targets. <laughs> there's lots and lots of uh, advice out there for targets. There's bazillions of books, there's training classes. Companies will often pay for this kind of training of like, you know, you're too inappropriately aggressive and angry. So we have partnered with this group to train all the people who are inappropriately aggressive and angry. Strange, they're all uh, women of all races or uh, people of color of all genders, you know? Hmm. Uh, so I avoid that. Uh, my, my advice in general is to find an ally uh, and to, to ask them to do this. So uh, you, this, if somebody came to me who was a target and asked for advice, that's usually what I asked, I recommend. So uh, the, qu the question here is um, how do you, when you're trying to improve this representation and you've got an underrepresented group, uh, so specifically that not represented in numbers, uh, um, then uh, in numbers proportional to the population, uh, then how do you avoid putting an extra burden on the marginalized group by making them do extra work? So uh, the, the main thing is to make sure that people are rewarded for their work, especially if they're a member of a marginalized group. When it comes to something like speaking at a company all hands, that in itself is a reward because getting your face out there and getting your words and ideas out there um, is, auto is like automatically a good thing uh, in itself. Uh, if, if somebody, it is possible that somebody could speak at the company all hands and not get promoted or recognized or valued for it. Uh, that's a, ser a very serious problem. Uh, when it comes to things which are tr generally not recognized or generally not rewarded, for example, uh, interviewing people, uh, that's a, that requires a systemic change in how you reward and promote people. So, um, if somebody is getting an unfair share of the burden of interviewing people, that should count towards their promotion and towards their compensation. Uh, it usually does not, which is why it, it's an unfair burden. Um, so uh, in general, uh, it's totally fine to uh, uh, offer to members of marginalized group more time, more representation for things which are, have a built-in reward, are already rewarded. Uh, if you're going to ask them to do more uh, difficult work that is rarely rewarded, you need to change your systems so that you do actually reward them for that work. So it's part of why the Ally Skills Workshop exists, is that uh, often marginalized people are doing the, the majority of diversity and inclusion work at your company, uh, and it's usually not rewarded uh, in any tangible way. It's usually just a burden. So um, moving that work off onto people who already have privilege and power uh, it may result in it becoming <laughs> rewarded, uh, but at least it's, it's not burdening the people who have the least power and the least um, uh, advantages. Okay, great. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and do one more scenario uh, and go run over the three hour limits uh, a little bit, uh, and then we'll do the wrap up, so. 
uh, a coworker comes out as trans, uh, another coworker assumes you are cis and starts complaining to you privately about how ridiculous it is to expect everyone to start using your coworker's new names, new name and pronouns. Uh, so just to note here, this is actually a situation where somebody uh, is coming to you privately and thinks that you're going to support them, right? So it's a slightly different than most of the scenarios. Any questions on this one? Great, okay. So this group talked about um, trying to find out more about why this person finds it so hard uh, uh, and talk about, for example, um, when people get married, they often change their names and, and nobody seems to complain about that. Uh, and then uh, talk about how it's, it's normal to make a mistake and then apologize and correct yourself and move on. So those are all really good points. Uh, this group said, uh, you, may, you may need to explain what cis and trans means to this person. Uh, and then you could say, hey, uh, I myself am cis, if you are cis. Uh, I just want to make a note that I put in here, assumed uh, that you are cis. If you're not cis, you don't have to do this work, right? Like obviously, uh, well, not obviously. It depends on uh, how, long, how long you've been passing or who, who have, um, who peop how people have treated you, but um, you don't need to take on this work because um, you are the target in this situation. So you can identify, if you are cis, you can identify yourself as cis and say like, hey, this means that I'm the gender that I was assigned at birth. This other person was not that lucky. Um, I feel really lucky. This is a privilege I have and I really appreciate it. Um, and so I have a lot of compassion for someone who doesn't have it. So that's a really, because uh, you're, you're changing, the, you're being vulnerable yourself. You're saying, hey, here's information uh, and you are changing the topic to, uh, how hard it must be to be the trans person, which is really where you want this to be uh, eventually. Cool. So this group started out by saying um, uh, that they would be shocked if this happened to them, uh, that they think it's just basic dis decency to call somebody the name and pronouns they want to be called. Um, just to note, like, uh, it is, uh, I think it's less important to focus on feeling shocked, especially for something that happens so much, right? Uh, so it's, it, this may be the first time you've encountered someone talking to you this way. Uh, I think an important thing to keep in mind is that if you're a target, this, is hap this happens to you quite frequently, right? Um, so being prepared for that and uh, uh, focusing on that. Uh, you can, of course, say like, hey, wow, I really don't agree with that at all, even a little bit, right? Which is, uh, uh, this group talked about saying in the moment something about disagreeing with this, which is great. Uh, then they also talked about like, hey, yeah, if you, if you aren't cis, uh, if you're trans in this situation, or if for some other reason you don't feel safe uh, having this conversation privately, uh, you can go ahead and talk to a manager or to HR as well. And I think this is a really important thing to keep in mind. We often think, oh, you know, I, the only thing I can do is me right then and I missed the opportunity and I'm done. Uh, but you can also come back to something or find other people. Uh, especially if you're not in a position of, of power in that situation. And, that, and they made another really good point, which is, um, so this is what this person is saying to me, who else are they talking to? What else are they saying to other people? This is a really good question to ask yourself. Whenever someone does something that's just, you're like, oh, that's a little bigoted, that's a little intolerant, but I don't want to overreact. Um, it's really important to think like, well, this is just what I'm seeing, uh, and I'm in a position of privilege here often. Uh, what is happening when I'm not around? and uh, to, to take that really seriously. Uh, you might want to take a look at the Al Capone theory of sexual harassment. I believe it's in the handout. If not, you can type Al Capone theory uh, sexual harassment into Twitter. Uh, it talks a lot about how one bigoted intolerant behavior goes along with other terrible behaviors. Uh, often, for example, uh, sexism and plagiarism are connected, uh, or somebody who's, doing, uh, who's committing sexual assault is also stealing money. Uh, very common things. Great, so this group had some really good points. Uh, they talked about many of the other things, but also um, talked about the importance of being like really clear up front uh, that they don't agree, that they don't agree with us, right? And saying like, hey, I think this is totally reasonable to, to use someone's uh, names and pronouns that, that are right for them. Uh, because uh, if you start out with something equivocal or say, tell me more, or uh, that can be interpreted as support, um, I, I agree with this because of the point that this group also made. Uh, in this particular situation, this person is coming to you because they think that you will agree with them or because they really care about your opinion. Uh, and so it, 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 this is actually a situation where someone is coming to you and saying, hey, give me a stamp of approval. Uh, and 
it is absolutely helpful, useful, and appropriate for you to say, I don't give you my stamp of approval. Um, it is a meaningful thing to do in that situation because this person is testing out whether they can bring, take this public, right? Uh, and, and try to make uh, other people uh, agree with them or act this way. So, so, so just briefly, the, the previous group said, uh, they agreed with the, what the other groups said in particular, being um, super direct and firm uh, in their response. Uh, and then the final group said uh, that they actually went, wanted to add on that um, uh, you can model uh, positive excitement about this person coming out saying like, I think it's so great that this person uh, came out and told us what name and gender they prefer and uh, or pronouns they prefer. And uh, that's wonderful. And I'm so excited for them. And I think it's a great opportunity to support them. They also suggest like you can, um, to prevent this up in the first place, uh, to make it super clear that there's a lot of support for this person. So perhaps asking them um, uh, after they've come out to say like, hey, could we have a party to celebrate you coming out? They might be like, heck no, I don't want that. Um, or they might be like, that sounds so great. I would love it if everyone sent me well wishes and, and positive comments. So uh, finding a way to, to, to express publicly uh, how great this is and how much you support them. So, uh, uh, I, I, I just want to note that this is a Captain Awkward technique. Uh, I have Captain Awkward in here again. Uh, the specific technique is um, when you're looking for a particular response to a piece of news, to model that response for the people or tell them explicitly what reaction you want. So uh, I recently shut down a nonprofit uh, and uh, my co-founder and I spent a lot of time crafting our message to say, hey, uh, we are somewhat sad that we're shutting down the nonprofit, but we're excited about what we're doing next. And we would love to hear your well wishes. Uh, um, but we're not looking for advice, right? So it, it, telling people exactly how you want them to respond is, a, is an important uh, technique to use there. Uh, something that I think a lot of you touched on here, uh, but I just want to make firm or make clear is that uh, you can, uh, somebody, this person is coming to you and saying, hey, feel sorry for me. I want you to have compassion for me because my life is so hard because I have to change the name and pronouns I use for this person. Right? So that's a shared value that says we should have compassion for people going through tough things. And you can say, hey, um, uh, I also find it hard to switch uh, what name and pronouns I'm using for this person. And it's embarrassing when I make a mistake. But wow, it's got to be like 100 times harder for the person who came out. Like that must be really hard having, uh, having to tell all these people this really difficult news that most a lot of people are not going to react well to and to be constantly called the wrong name and the wrong pronouns. Um, that's got to be super and misgendered. That's got to be really tough. Uh, and that's a thing that you can add, add on to the like, you know, but I'm so excited that they did it because they're getting to be who they are. And I'm really excited to be supporting them. Um, you know, as a cis person, I have this incredible privilege. Uh, you can uh, put all of that together. So it's a really useful technique um, when you actually have an opportunity to change someone's mind, which this is because this person is deliberately coming to you asking for support. It means that they do care about your opinion and you have an influence on them. Um, in particular, uh, this looks like looking for the shared value, picking up on that shared value and saying, hey, I agree with you on this shared value. Let me apply it in a way you didn't think about. Uh, so this happens a lot with uh, things like, um, uh, so if somebody comes and complains to you about, uh, for example, um, a scholarship to a conference that's for marginalized pe people from marginalized groups. And they say, hey, it's not fair that these people are getting an advantage that they get um, more money uh, to go to this conference. And you can say, yeah, I think, it, I think people should have an equal opportunity uh, for, to attend this conference. Uh, it's just that it's actually the privileged people who have more opportunity because they are paid more because of systemic oppression. Uh, and so like I share with you this value of fairness, it's just that actually it's the other way around than you think. Uh, and you can also share that at one point you didn't believe that, you believe the other thing, and then here's what changed my mind, I read this study. So it's a really powerful technique, uh, and it, I go into detail in the article called uh, Changing Hearts and Minds uh, and in the handout. Okay, we're going to uh, do questions, and then we'll go to the wrap-up. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so the question is, what to do if you have this conversation, or you make a change, or you make an intervention, and the person says, I don't agree. I'm not going to change my mind. Uh, so this is where it's really important to have a super clear, detailed code of conduct 
that says, hey, here, here are expectations for how you behave in the workplace. And it needs to be detailed. It can't be like vague and like no isms or uh, just like be nice to people, uh, be excellent to people is not, to each other is not, is not a code of conduct. Um, you don't have to change people's minds. In this particular situation, it's about somebody making it clear that they're open to your opinion and that they care about your opinion. They may not change their mind. Uh, most of the time you're focusing on changing behavior. Uh, and that's where it, it comes back to like having a clearly documented company culture and a method of enforcing it, uh, escalating as, as you need up to management or to HR or to somebody that that person respects personally, uh, that kind of thing. Generally speaking, having the same argument over and over again or having a really long argument is a waste of your time. Uh, it's good to make one try at a thing and see how they respond. If the response is, no, I totally disagree and I'm not listening, don't, don't keep going there. Focus on like, okay, well, here's what we do at this company. Uh, here's the documentation. If you have a problem with this, you can go talk to this person uh, and you yourself can escalate it uh, if, they, if they choose not to. Make sense? Great. Awesome. Cool. All right. So we're going to, I had, I had extra scenarios in case we had time, but it, we did not. So I'll skip through these. Okay. Uh, and go to advanced ally skills. Uh, very quickly, let me grab a link for you. Um, so we're going to actually do uh, a, an exercise. One moment. The goal setting exercise. Uh, so I'm putting this in the chat. You can download that. Uh, and we'll spend some time, just five minutes, uh, answering the questions on this. You can just write it on a piece of paper or you can type it into a text editor. So this is about setting specific goals for yourself and then saying, here's the next steps I'm going to take uh, uh, for the next period of time. Uh, if you have difficulty coming up with a specific goal, like uh, that, uh, I would suggest doing something like uh, become more aware of um, uh, oppression happening within my company. So for example, you could say, I'm going to start counting every time I join a meeting, um, how many people are, for, are from these groups and paying attention to who is taking the notes. Uh, or you could do something like, um, I feel super uncomfortable talking about race, so I'm going to practice doing that. I'm going to go read uh, books on it and you know, that sort of thing. So, all right. I love seeing everyone's monitor moving as they're typing. So, good. <laughs> uh, so, um, advanced ally skills uh, set specific goals for yourself for the next week, week, month, or year, which is what you just did with that exercise. Uh, I suggest treating ally actions as a bare minimum expectation for everyone. Sometimes when you take an ally action, people will be so surprised and so impressed that they'll, they'll praise you or they might give you a literal standing ovation. Um, I recommend reacting that, to that kind of thing by saying like, what? That's just normal. Everybody should do that. Uh, and what you're doing is you're making, it, uh, making the people around you think, oh, I could also be doing that. And you're spreading out the work some more uh, instead of being like, oh, only the special superstar ally can do that, right? So uh, I, you should follow and support leaders from target groups. Uh, the thing about... Um, uh, target groups is they already know what they need and want uh, in order to make their situation better. Uh, unfortunately, uh, people who have a lot of privilege will often come in and say, hi, surprise, here's the thing I decided you needed. Uh, for example, like here's the app I wrote for you. That happens a lot. And the target groups are like, uh, that's not what we needed. We needed this other thing entirely. Um, so get good at listening, following, and supporting uh, uh, leaders from, from target groups. Uh, follow your discomfort. So if something makes you feel bad, find out more and understand why before reacting. Uh, so often a thing that happens when you're act, you've decided, hey, I'm going to act as an ally is you're going to make a mistake and someone will point out to you, hey, you just um, were, were relying on your privilege or you just said something that was offensive or oppressive to this group. Uh, and you might feel guilty about that. Uh, and often the way we deal with guilt, because it's a very unpleasant uh, feeling, is to become angry instead, which is a more enjoyable feeling. And say like, hey, you know, I'm such a good ally. I've donated to these organizations and I'm married to somebody from this target group and uh, all that sort of thing. So that's called being defensive. Um, I think it's really important to, when, you, when you've decided to start acting as an ally, to understand why you feel bad before you react. Uh, if you feel bad because somebody has, is being a real jerk to you, 
then it's fine to go ahead and react to be angry. But a lot of the time it's going to be somebody's just pointed out uh, your privilege or that you're harming people uh, and that you feel guilty about it. In which case you wanna say, thank you so much for pointing that out to me. Uh, I'm gonna do more work on that. Uh, what I should have done is this uh, and then go on with the conversation. So, which is an example of uh, what, uh, apologizing, correcting yourself and moving on. So the thing is, is that um, if you are not making mistakes, you are not changing the world, right? Uh, if you want to act as an ally, you're going to screw up. You're going to make mistakes. That's fine. Um, what's important is that you apologize, correct yourself and move on. You want to learn from your mistakes and you want to show other people how to react uh, when somebody is kind enough to point out their mistake. Uh, so mistakes are fine. It's how you react that's important and, and that you do the work to uh, prevent yourself from making the mistake again in the future. All right, so most of this workshop is you all chatting with each other. So um, I just want to thank you all for, for doing that and for participating fully. It was a really, really impressive set of solutions that came out of the group today. So uh, that's, that's all for now. Uh, we can do questions till 1030 if anyone has them. Thank you. Sure. So the question is, um, do I have any advice about being an ally on social media? Uh, so a lot of this stuff will work similarly. So play for, uh, play for the audience is really helpful. Uh, figuring out whether somebody is going to listen to you, in which case you can, it's worthwhile trying something privately first, uh, but making sure that something, something happens publicly. Uh, so here's the, the general advice I give. It's called Charles Rules of Argument, and it's in your handout. Uh, the first piece of advice is don't go looking for an argument. So there's somebody wrong on the internet somewhere. <laughs> You're looking for somebody who's wrong on the internet, the part of the internet you already participate in because uh, people there are more likely to know who you are and respect your opinion rather than some random person just showing up out of nowhere. Uh, if you do choose to have an argument, uh, state your position once speaking to the audience. Uh, so this is about changing the mind of the person, the minds of the people who are more likely to change their mind. Uh, than the person who's just done something terrible. They might change their mind, uh, but uh, that's not, not super common. Uh, so then you need to wait for any absurd replies. So people are gonna misunderstand what you've said intentionally or unintentionally, it doesn't matter. Uh, you, you may have written something that was unclear, right? So you save those up uh, and then you reply one time to correct any understandings, misunderstandings of your first statement. Don't expand on things, don't add new arguments, just correct anything that was misunderstood. And this is the hard part, number five, do not reply again. <laughs> it's really difficult, but this is the key to being effective on social media because people don't keep reading after that first initial couple of replies. So you're wasting your time, you're just arguing with someone who has more time than you. Uh, and number six, like uh, spend time doing something fun instead, like walking the dog or playing with your kids or drinking a beer, like whatever it is that gives you uh, energy for coming back and doing more the next time. I just want to give credit. Uh, Charles rules are uh, by Charles Miller, who uh, had a blog on the internet in 2004 uh, and liked to have arguments until he didn't any longer. And then he wrote these, uh, wrote up this guide to not having an argument. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate this work. All right, other questions? All right, great, we'll go ahead and end. And uh, thank you so much for everyone who could come and participated. It was really wonderful working with you today.